Okay, and Levy is actually going to be here a little before seven o'clock, and so, someone received, to go back home. received a call <laughs> that this wasn't happening until next week, and so I uh, turned around. And on my way home, ordered a Google pizza and got a drink and kind of relaxed at home. So let's all pray that Google pizza has better security than Equifax. <laughs> you know, Lou's talking about, or Professor Spellman's talking about passive versus active, and I don't want to keep you here very long. I really want to talk about a few things that I think will, um, okay, uh, a few investment ideas I think will work today in this environment. You know, the passive versus active is something that goes back and forth from 2000 to 2009. Active had the upper hand because uh, people had just experienced the dot-com crash and the Great Recession and uh, came to the realization that maybe it was as important to preserve capital in a bear market as it is to make capital in a bull. Um, it's really the, the indiscriminate funneling of money into various uh, companies through passive management that I think is actually giving us, it causes a misallocation of capital and it's given us a good opportunity and I think it's an opportunity right now that the time is, is probably right for you to uh, consider these types of things in your own portfolio. Uh, there, there are ideas that passive misses. Uh, they, uh, so in a, when money's flowing into the market and all ships or all boats uh, rise, uh, you know, or float or whatever the saying is, a rising tide. Um, at the same time, when money starts flowing out of the markets, those very same companies that have benefited from passive investments are going to get punished uh, more than others that haven't. And some of these, uh, start with, can I use your little pointer? Uh, here's one that's, that we use a lot, and I think uh, the high dividend payers with growing, growing earnings, uh, the caveat being there is that you have to be covering your dividend. And obviously, someone can pay you uh, 8 or 10 percent dividend, and if they're not uh, earning enough to pay that dividend, at some point they're going to have to reduce it, and their stock is going to end up, their stock price will end up suffering by probably more than the dividend you were enjoying. Uh, there's a lot of those out there. They tend to be in the uh, $2 billion to maybe $20 billion market cap. So they're by and large missed by, uh, by passive investing because passive investing typically favors uh, the larger cap stocks. If it's indexes, uh, you know, just the three largest S&P 500 index ETFs have almost a trillion dollars between the three of them invested. So obviously that benefits the Apples and the Microsofts and uh, the other very large companies. These, these don't get probably, well, in the S&P 500, they're not even in it. They're more uh, small mid-cap to uh, mid-size mid-cap, maybe even very small large cap. But they're not getting much of that attention. Some of those same companies, the Facebooks, Googles, what have you, there are so many ETFs that while money's flowing in, they, it's a great thing to own them individually. Uh, it's just when money starts flowing out, that can be a problem. These things, we, we find that even on bad days in the market, uh, this past week where we had several down days in a row, they're not, uh, these are mostly active managers are going and finding these. So they're not being sold off uh, through ETF sales and such. Uh, they might be in anything from, uh, you know, doing non-bank banking, doing loans uh, of different types. They might be into real estate, uh, mortgages, a uh, number of different areas. So you can diversify amongst them. And uh, typically we find eight to 10%. I know that sounds very high for a dividend, but that's what the market is doing. These are selling at really inexpensive uh, uh, PE ratios, and uh, their growth rate is extremely good. As a matter of fact, the only ones we're investing in, and I would suggest you do the same, is ones that the earnings have been growing and are, uh, continue, are expected to continue to grow. That makes for a safe dividend, and what we find is that as the stocks have appreciated in value, 
because of the growing earnings, they actually have been able to, uh, in most cases, increase their dividend as well. So the yield is, is remaining high. Industrial property REITs that own distribution centers, that's part, pretty much from creative destruction. You have distribution centers that, uh, you know, they're distributing for Amazon and uh, many other companies. It's the online group now uh, that are using distribution centers. Uh, Floating rate loans, of course, they're a great hedge against rising interest rates. So if we do get the interest rates, because now we've got a Fed that's saying that they're going to start selling assets, albeit slowly, and raising Fed funds rate, albeit slowly. Uh, if we do get some rising interest rates, uh, th those are good, and they pay a pretty decent uh, uh, yield or dividend rate uh, right now today. So they're they can fit into a portfolio today. And in the event of this, well, you've already got them in there. I think it makes for a good diversification. Here's, an, here's one that you probably, it's unlikely you've heard of it, and it's not an annuity, it's not a life insurance policy. There's actually uh, only a few companies that uh, do it correctly, but what they're doing is they're going out and buying life insurance policies from people that are 75 years of old or older. People that would like to have the cash from the policy and they get, they can actually pay for that policy at a higher rate than the insurance company is willing to because they might have a surrender value of X dollars, but they can still buy that policy maybe at 20%, 30% higher than the insurance company is willing to pay you uh, for surrendering it. And they're, uh, they typically operate on about a 16% IRR. So they're able to, after all expenses, and even with some people living a little longer because they also hedge the mortality tables in doing so, uh, they're able to pay somewhere in that 10, 11% per year uh, uh, dividend range. Uh, not, they're not something that you expect, they're more of a bond replacement, they're not something you expect a capital gain in, but you know, 10 or 11% in this environment from something as simple as life insurance because that's, pretty much uncorrelated with the stock market. I might even argue that it could possibly be in a really bad stock market to be inversely correlated. <laughs> uh, preferred shares, again, they typically have lower volatility than uh, com the common stock, and they tend to be in the 6 to 8% uh, dividend deal. So uh, they're not something that you're going to uh, they're not for your big capital gains. They're pretty much like a bond replacement as well, but at six to eight percent, they sure take the place of a bond. Because right now, we look at bonds as just being, uh, if you get a four percent coupon, uh, uh, you're probably paying a, a large premium for it. And we uh, consider bonds, we've always talked about bonds. I mean, it's been the history of bonds. I'm sure all of you have heard it a million times in your life or at least a few, uh, that uh, bonds are a risk-free return. But now with the advent of probably having rising interest rates where they've become a return-free risk. And uh, so this is a good way, preferred shares. Uh, you know, there's a few things you want to look at in there. You want to uh, uh, make sure that they're not something that's able to be called away from you because if they're selling a little bit over par, you still can see what the, the yield to maturity or yield to call is, but you don't want something that most of them are the call date is uh, far out in the future if they even have a call date. Hotel REITs, especially good if inflation materializes or economy remains strong. So they're doing good right now. They pay, they tend to pay again a nice uh, dividend yield. I'm talking a lot about yields because bonds are something that we can't find right now uh, that are worth, uh, that we believe are worth owning. So the hotel REITs, they're good, and they're especially good if inflation materializes, because number one, you have real estate, which typically does very well in an uh, inflationary environment. The other thing you have is uh, a product where the lease is usually by the day. So if we have high inflation, I have just leased out my office building at, uh, you know, $30 a foot, and now uh, office space is going for $40 a foot, and as a publicly traded company, my stock is getting hit because of that. 
Well, these, if the hotel is uh, $200 a night and rates uh, inflation hits, they can be $220 uh, tomorrow and $300 next month. Uh, so it's nice having that kind of pricing power. <coughs> Talk about babies thrown out with the ETF bathwater. Uh, the thing about ETFs is even the way they're sold is that uh, and I think they're a good idea in some cases, <clears throat> but they've expanded to so many sectors and there are so many things that now the idea is, and they're even sold as, you know, why take single stock risk when you can own the entire sector? Well, if you're looking at banks, for instance, you know, there's a time, and uh, excuse me, uh, anyone that works with Wells Fargo, because this is not an all the time thing, but. You know, Wells Fargo hadn't been something that I wanted to own in the last several months. They've been under a lot of fire and remain that way. It's kind of like owning Equifax today. You know, uh, I would prefer my ETF if I could uh, have my perfect ETF, but I certainly wouldn't have those two in the financials uh, ETF right now. And you could always come up with examples. Why own the worst 20%? But and the flip side is, is that when something goes out of favor, I'll give you a good example, is uh, oil in July of 14 was $140 a barrel. Some 20 months later, it was $26 a barrel. During that time, the, all the oil ETFs, which there's a number of them, uh, XLE is a big one and there's a bunch of others, but they're all selling, 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 selling. So all the companies in those ETFs were going down in price. Well, a lot of them it made sense. If you're an oil exploration company and oil's dropping from 140 to 26, you would certainly expect your share price to drop with it because your earnings are dropping. But look on the flip side is there were also pipelines and especially uh, natural gas pipelines because natural gas when it goes from $14 to $3, we use a lot more of it. Keep our houses warmer in the winter, and we, uh, you know, the, the whole thing. Of course, you're gonna use more at $3. So the pipelines, they're a taxi cab. Their, their earnings were growing, and what we found is you literally had share prices, because they were part of the ETFs, going down this direction on the graph, Earnings going like this, they were paying nine and ten percent dividends, and uh, about the time oil got down to twenty-six dollars a barrel, and you could see that global supply and global demand had reversed, and now supply was no longer larger than demand. You had to figure at that point, like every commodity, it's all global supply and global demand, which direction that commodity is going to go. So it started to go. Of course, it would start to rise again. And especially in the case of a natural gas pipeline, because what else was happening in February, March of 2016 was that we were starting to uh, export natural gas for the first time. So we had uh, even another reason to be bullish on those. But anytime you see earnings growing like this, you would expect stock price to be kind of padding along with it. So we look for. Uh, ETF or the babies that are thrown out with the bathwater, just like that. It's something that you can find as well. I'm not trying to just throw up things that, you know, I've got the magic database and you can't have it uh, or out or you can't have it without going through me. That's not it. I'm just trying to give you the ideas. This is all things that, you know, little research you can find just as well. Uh, <coughs> foreign debt when, course, when the corresponding currency is growing in favor. I'll give you something that I expect will happen here that you can watch out for. It's kind of easy to watch this one because uh, if you don't notice it because of the commodities growing, it happened back when China was building uh, 100 airports a month. You know, they were building airports like, I mean, I mean it was like, uh, it was incredible. There, but they were building airports, they were building roads, they were building everything. Of course, they were using commodities from all over. The Canadian dollar rose, the Australian Aussie rose against the US dollar, uh, Brazilian real, all the commodity countries, uh, their currencies start to rise. If you don't notice that, that it's happening, I think it's gonna happen again because China's pretty serious about the Silk Road 
and building the ports and roads and everything that goes with it uh, to connect China with Europe. So this Chinese Silk Road is actually started, they're starting to uh, gain some traction and they've got involving a lot of countries, but China is strongly behind it. And I think we could have another commodity boom like we did before. So you'll either see the commodities rising and, and the uh, demand growing. Another way you can see it is you can watch the currencies of commodity countries. Because you see uh, the Aussies at 78 cents uh, right now. Uh, if you see it go to 80, 82, then it's a good time to start watching what, what's happening with the commodities that they're selling because they go hand in hand. Foreign debt is a great thing in that environment because uh, give you a little, I mean, something to look for back when China was uh, really growing before and using uh, all commodities in the world. General Electric had a bond here that was paying, I believe it was like three and a half percent. And it had the same term bond in Australia, denominated in Aussies, paying either seven or seven and a half. So knowing what was going on and expecting the Aussie to rise against the dollar, uh, we bought the Aussie denominated bond. So you can, same company, same company backing the bond, same term just a higher interest rate. And then the nice thing was that the Aussie did rise. In matter of fact, it rose about 30% that year. So you had a 7%, 7.5% dividend or coupon along with 30% uh, currency appreciation. So that's a pretty good bond. But that's something that you can do. You gotta watch the currency and, and understand why it's, why it's doing something. But right now we have a lot of indicators. We have. Mario Draghi over with the ECB, just like we have Janet Yellen here. Uh, well, we're talking about maybe tapering, maybe getting a little bit higher Fed funds rate. Uh, at least that was the story last week. It seemed to change uh, this morning, but you know, it, it's obviously going to move slowly. But the same goes with Europe. Someone's going to flinch and someone's going to start to taper and tighten. And when that happens, if, so if it's the Europeans that actually taper faster than we do, we'll expect the, the euro to appreciate. So one's going to appreciate against the other, uh, and it gives you some opportunity in their bonds. And then finally, I think Professor kind of went over uh, this area uh, just now, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. But there, obviously, there's companies. Those are, you know, three examples that everyone's familiar with, but there's uh, certainly huge examples all over, and I find especially biotech to be one of the most exciting ones. As a matter of fact, I think that might be the, sa the savior of our health care system, is that ultimately we start uh, uh, curing people of things, and it, it will have the opposite effect, I believe, in what a lot of people are thinking that, well, now they're going to be on a drug for for a long time, but we're actually starting to find cures. If you cure someone, you're only on the drug for a little bit of time, and it tends to cost a whole lot less than keeping someone on the drug for life. So th that could be uh, something that's certainly an exciting area to watch. The uh, only thing we would add to that is that if you're watching particular biotechs, uh, there's, uh, we we've taken the uh, attitude that we'd rather miss the first 50% or 7,500% gain in one than try to, uh, as a matter of fact, there's a good one on Alzheimer's that just played out this morning uh, with Ac is it Axon, Exxon, I believe, uh, that they had a promising al Alzheimer's uh, drug and yesterday it was announced at the end of trading that uh, it missed and it didn't achieve its goals. And so today it was down 79%. We said, well, we could have, we'd be very happy, and I always have felt this way, is that you can miss the first 100% move if it had gone from $24 instead of going to six or whatever it went to today, if it had gone from 24 to 50, and it was working, and you now you knew it was working, you can get in at 50, and that one's gonna go a long way. So that's the nice thing about uh, biotech. Uh, 
uh, is uh, not having to be early. In fact, it's pretty scary to try to be early. And that's uh, with that. I think I'm gonna got kind of a late start, so I want to didn't want to keep you here long, but appreciate the the minutes that you gave me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.